So this is a quick lesson on Because I Could Not Stop for Death by Emily Dickinson, one of her most famous poems. Very kind of fun and whimsical, but quite dark kind of a characteristic of her dark humor as well. I really like this one, it's one of my favorites. So um, read the poem aloud to yourself if you haven't already, or you can catch my recording of it separately from this lesson if you like to. I'm gonna jump straight into the vocab so with poems, you always want to just check that you understand the words properly and precisely each time and you know what they mean. So um, you can take a second to kind of pause, look through this vocab list, maybe jot down anything that you think is going to be helpful. It's quite a lot, so I'll just kind of scroll through it slowly. Yeah, so we'll jump into the story summary. So essentially what she's saying here is it was impossible for me to stop for death. I, you know, I was too busy to think about death. He stopped for me instead kindly. So death is personified as a sort of gentlemanly figure. And they take a carriage ride together, which is similar to kind of taking a taxi nowadays, but a bit more old fashioned and fancy, like a horse and carriage. So the only things in this carriage, the only things they were driving or riding with um, was the speaker, death and immortality, which represents the idea of everlasting life. They drove slowly along the, along the road because death didn't need to rush. And she also had kind of prioritized death for, for once over all of her other tasks in order to be polite and civil to him. So he'd been kind to her, so she was being kind to him. They went past the school where children worked hard at the break recess and the children were arranged into a ring. And then they went past fields of grain that watched the carriage as it traveled by. And finally, they passed the setting sun. There's a little dash here that we'll go back to when we look at the structure. Actually, the sun passed them because he was also traveling. As he set, the dew drops drew near, all trembling and chill. And she realized that she was wearing very light, fine clothing. Then they get to a house and it looks like a swelling in the ground and the earth and you can barely see the roof of it. And then we jump forwards at the end. It's been a hundred years since then, but it still feels shorter than the day when I first realized that these horses' heads that are pulling the carriage were pointing towards eternity. So she realizes that she's died and she's now in a state of eternity, um, or she's kind of headed towards eternity. And since then, time has completely shifted. It's hundred years hence, hundred years into the future. But the sense of time, the perceptions changed. So it's about life and death, and it's about how our perception of time shifts when we're in different states of um, being or non-being. So it's a very fun kind of whimsical poem, but it is also about somebody's death. So it's kind of dark at the center of it, even though you've got this kind of carriage ride with a gentleman and a lady. So it's a very interesting poem. Uh, with, yeah, a lot of dimensions and perspectives to it. So I'm going to unpick some of those for you now. So we're going to just look first at the speaker. She is uh, a lady, definitely. She's wearing um, gossamer and tulle. She has a dark but playful and whimsical tone when she's talking about when she met death. And it kind of happens all of a sudden. And it's very unexpected. And it wasn't planned. So there is a traditional belief that death comes to those when they're ready to go. And the speaker possibly couldn't stop for her, you know, couldn't possibly stop for death herself because she's not thinking about it. It's not her time to die as far as she is aware. So we've got this idea that it's not um, really down to individual humans when they die. So it's sort of a, a memento mori in a way, a phrase that means we all die at some point and Almost all of us, that is an entirely chaotic, random event. So it's quite deterministic, this perspective, a deterministic view. 
which means we're not really in control of our own lives or our own death. And the process of dying is like a journey through time and space. So it's very um, abstracted. It's not particularly tied to any religious doctrine, which is quite interesting. Sometimes Dickinson does draw a lot on Christian doctrine and sometimes she's a bit more abstract or experimental. And this one is an interesting sort of experimental one. It really reminded me of this line in Hamlet, all that lives must die passing through nature to eternity. So um, Dickinson as a lover of Shakespeare potentially was sort of drawing on this line when she was thinking about it. It's the same idea of life, death and transition going on there. So if you've got time, I want you to just have a quick look at this little task, go back to the poem and try and sketch out what type of person, what character, what personality is this. It's always a poetic persona. So even though this is a poem spoken in the first person, it's a female, it is obviously an aspect of Dickinson that she's expressing, but it's not her entire self. So you want to think of it as a poetic persona rather than Dickinson herself when she's speaking. So we're going to jump a bit more deeply and precisely into analysis now. So there's a lot of pronouns, we, he, I. This is quite varied and it grounds us in selves and characters which are then pitted against the abstract concepts of the poem. And there's lots of abstract nouns there, death, eternity, immortality. All of these are very difficult to comprehend. And our self is kind of like the starting point by which we understand these abstract concepts. They're all personified as passages in the carriage, death and immortality, sorry. Eternity is kind of the, the destination. So they're all proper nouns. So it's kind of like death and immortality are sort of human in a way or kind of humanoid. And eternity is more like a location or a final destination of this carriage. So the entire poem is an extended metaphor for death. And usually poems about death are quite sad or morbid, but this one's kind of fun and unexpected and in some ways quite humorous um, and a little confusing and unusual, but it's not necessarily sad. Um, so it's, yeah, an interesting, quite alternative perspective on, on death there. So the tenor if you, if you want to go really deep into metaphors, you don't have to go this deep, but the tenor is the act of death and the vehicle is a carriage ride, which I think is quite clever because obviously a carriage in itself is a vehicle. I don't know if she was thinking of that when she made this poem. So there's varied images that they pass by as they're going on this journey. And those images sort of um, appear and disappear depending on the stanza that we're in. And she's kind of passing through the realm of the living and through nature into uh, the state of eternity, which is something far more abstracted than any physical imagery could describe. So the things that she describes imagistically, we have a school, maybe something that's familiar to her because she does say the school, and then a house as the sun is setting. But the house itself is kind of unfamiliar, like it's sunk into the ground. Um, I looked into this and what people think about this house and the general consensus, because it, it did confuse me actually, seems to be that um, it's sort of a grave or a tomb that's both above and below ground. It might also be a charnel house. So charnel houses, I don't know if they, I don't think they exist anymore, but they used to be places in, on church grounds where the bones of the dead were kept. It might also suggest that time has passed and the speaker is unaware of it. The house maybe represents the idea of ruin, the idea of the way in which physical matter that exists in a solid form on earth eventually degrades back into rubble, then earth, then dust um, or soil. So we have this, that's a slightly more biblical interpretation, the idea that everything concrete eventually dissipates back into earth and dust. There's a lot of Gothic imagery here. It's a very Gothic poem. So the figure of death itself, obviously, is very Gothic. Um, and he represents the Grim Reaper. So we'll, we'll kind of come back to that one in a minute. Her dress is made of gossamer 
which is an ambiguous word. There's two interpretations. So the first one is that it could be uh, a fine silk material, quite a rich material, um, suggesting again the nature of a lady and a gentleman going on a carriage ride. But also, it is the material from which spider webs are woven. So gossamer is, um, yeah, almost like a kind of like a kind of gothic, creepy image of her dress being made of cobwebs. Her shawl is tulle, which is a kind of net or mesh, which also is this kind of fine, very thin material. For me as well, that that's kind of a transition into a ghostly state of being. So it's sort of like her physical concrete self is fading away and she's becoming pure spirit rather than matter. Um, so I see that as quite a beautiful kind of delicate but very gothic image. She starts to feel chill at sunset as well, which is kind of um, her self and her self-awareness kind of fades in and out of this poem. And then by the end, she's not got any concept of time left. So her, her perceptions start to warp and shift as she goes through. You might have noticed as well, finally, the anaphora. We pass the school, we pass the fields of gazing green, we pass the setting sun. So there's this kind of repetitive feeling um, as if it's almost all overwhelming or she's just trying to categorize and quantify what's happening to her. Um, so yeah, it's quite interesting as well if you look into the man-made versus natural imagery. Some of it is things that humans have made and some of the things are more what just exist in nature. So structure then, it's a narrative poem it's a story, so it's not just a lyrical poem. A lot of Dickinson's poems are actually lyrical rather than narrative. Um, but yeah, this one has a full story to it. There's time shifts where she's moving slowly at times and then suddenly skipping forward several centuries. So you, you might want to have a look at when does it feel slow, when does it feel fast, the way that she's skipping through the imagery of the poem. The opening and ending are always good things to structurally look at. So the first one is kind of ironic um, and a little bit surprising. Um, it's a euphemism saying she's maybe unprepared to think about her own death or to consider it, which is a very common human phenomenon that we, we all know that we're going to die, but very few of us really like to complete, uh, contemplate death. It's, it's considered morbid. It's sort of usually socially unacceptable to fixate too much on your death. So it's kind of a dark humor because she's not thinking about it. She's just kind of living her life, but suddenly she finds herself in the presence of death. Um, so we kind of endeared to the speaker for that reason. We probably see ourselves as similar to her because most of us uh, avoid or ignore the idea of contemplating death too much. Um, and death also is a kindly figure. He's, he's surprisingly nice. A lot of depictions of this grim reaper type figure a frightening um, kind of horror images, but he looks like a gentleman. He's a male persona. Um, the idea kindly, is, I also in, interpret it as a double entendre. So on the one hand, she's kind of maybe half grateful that death has paid attention to her, but also a little bit annoyed because she's like, well, because he's kind, I have to respond in turn and be attentive to him. Whereas actually I was busy with my own stuff. I didn't really want this to happen now. So there's a bit of um, reluctance or kind of tension there between what the speaker would like to do and then what she's sort of confronted with and what she has to do. Um, so yeah, the, the final line is actually a volta, which is interesting because normally volta's come earlier up in the poem. This is like a turning point. And she realizes far too late and far too late in the poem that the heads of the horses in the carriage that they're riding are turned towards eternity, that she's never getting off this ride. That's just her state now. She's transitioned into um, you know, a, post a posthumous state. Um, yeah, so in some ways, death maybe tricked or deceived her into complying, but also it's not painful or tragic. She's kind of slipped into it quite organically and so it's a kind of complex idea about death that it's not, there's not a sense of mourning or grief here, which is actually quite a reaction, I think, to the average yeah. attitude of death to people at this time, because um, 
Victorians or kind of 19th century people typically were quite, um, they took death very seriously and it was in, intensely painful and tragic for everyone who was still alive. And um, she's not really got that perspective on it, which I find really interesting. Um, so yeah, the idea of eternity uh, does sort of chime with the idea of immortality. So we've got these sort of eternal, perpetual, forever states, which is a reminder that the state of transition into the spiritual from the physical is uh, far more permanent, according to, depends on your worldview and your religious perspective, but to people who are religious generally, they tend to think of life as very temporary and fleeting and um, the state after life is as permanent and eternal. So it's quite interesting that transition between um, things that are very, very ephemeral and short-lived versus things that are permanent and forever. Um, immortality as well perhaps suggests that Dickinson wished in some way to be remembered after her death or to be recorded. Um, it's kind of weird because she didn't actually published that many poems in her lifetime and she was quite a humble character so um it depends like, on, on how you see her as a person critics actually disagree with this about her as well so you, you should develop your own opinion on that basically whether you think she she's sort of thinking about herself and her own um, remembrance after death she uses common meter common measure um, there's a lot of words here that kind of explain it in detail if you're interested if you're writing on Dickinson at a high level, I would recommend getting used to her meter because that's one of the more advanced things you can analyze in poetry. Um, so you can pause and kind of read through. I'm gonna skip it just for the sake of not confusing you and stressing you out too much. Um, and then again, slant rhyme is another one. So this is characteristic of Dickinson. Um, it's not a full rhyme. It's kind of like sometimes full rhyme, sometimes assonance or consonant. So it's kind of, um, going a little bit back and forth. So, sejora as well are very important. This is when you've got these little dashes and it's a stylistic feature of Dickinson, quite characteristic of her that other people don't do as much or don't kind of, uh, sometimes people kind of try and embrace it in more modernist poetry, but it's quite an unusual stylistic feature for her time. Um, so yeah, she sometimes uses bra uh, sorry dashes instead of brackets um, and sometimes she just uses them to sort of propel the line forwards. And obviously, if we think about a carriage ride that's slowing down, speeding up, um, it, it creates more of an energetic sense of that movement of the carriage through the way that she's using dashes. Um, there's a few different precise analyses of different types of sejora here and what they mean in context. So again, pause if you want to go deeper into that. I'm going to whiz through it. Um, so yeah, attitudes, these are always really fundamental to a poem. The first one I kind of went through already, nobody really wants to confront their own death. Death is often unexpected and we don't have much control over it. Um, I actually have a psychological interpretation of it here. It's important that um, this is not exactly how Dickinson would have seen the poem herself because um, it predates modern psychology. But yeah, it does feel to me like there's a sort of tension between her ego wants to live and is busy and trying to get on with life and ignore death. And then the, the core aspect of herself, her id, um, is just kind of naturally accepting, you know, that death is a part of life and a fact of life. So there is a tension between different parts of her mind in terms of how much she accepts this carriage ride. There's also this idea, um, that death is a kind of suitor a little bit because it's a male and female persona. So death is a little bit like a union or a marriage. There's a speaker in a gown um, and she's sort of heading with a man as if they're going to a ball. So it's sort of like a union. Um, and I think maybe you can interpret that metaphorically as playing a new role in life, leaving your old self behind. There's various figures of um, death in the maiden that this reminds me of, which is a really interesting medieval trope where um, there's a woman depicted in the prime of her life who's young and then an old figure of death who arrives and kind of uh, 
takes her life too early. You see this more in cultures where uh, death was kind of more prevalent or common at a younger age, and it's sort of a way of people processing the idea that sometimes people die very early and it's sort of unexpected, but part of the chaos of life. Um, so yeah, Death and the Maiden. I recommend looking up a few different versions of it because lots of artists interpret that image in their own way. Um, there's a little bit more on Death and the Maiden here if you want to read about it. Yeah, so a couple more context points then just to go a bit deeper. In the ring, I kind of, it, for me, it reminds me of this idea of, um, you know, ring a ring of roses. I don't know if you know that song. Um, but yeah, it's this idea of children sing quite dark nursery rhymes that are often about death or sickness or that kind of thing. Um, so even these young children at the beginning of their lives still have some concept of death. Uh, like it's kind of woven into the fabric of life in a way, rather than being something um, that only appears right at the end. Um, yeah, so this is a Ring, Ring of Roses picture that I found. Yeah, so just finally, final little task for you. Um, I've written some themes here, so if you want, you can pause and just sort of jot down um, or even maybe make mind maps on each of these themes and how they connect to the poem. So hopefully you're feeling a lot more confident on this one. It is a complex poem. Most of her poems are, they sort of sound simple and then you go deeper into them and they're just full of all sorts of crazy. <laughs> um, so yeah, hopefully you enjoyed this poem and uh, it's not too depressing or morbid for you. Um, so yeah, thank you for listening and I'll hopefully see you guys soon in a future session. Mm -hmm.